Prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Myths dispelled. From the studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Hey, welcome back to another week. We're going to be talking to Julian Smith about his book, The Flinch. You know, it's said that that which does not kill you can make you stronger. And if that's true, then Julian Smith may actually be able to make you stronger. How you doing, Julian? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, first of all, before we get started with the actual book itself and discussing it, what made you uh, write this book? <laughs> uh, I wrote The Flinch because I'm probably one of the worst victims of the stuff that I uh, actually wrote about. I felt for like many, many years that I was sort of uh, really challenged, really sort of beaten down over and over again by myself more than anyone else. And, uh, and I, I kept sort of struggling with it. And finally, sort of by writing The Flinch, it's almost like exercising the demon a little bit. I get to a point where I feel like I've identified it. You know what they say? A demon, if you sort of call out its true name, then uh, you have power over it. Well, that's how I felt after I wrote that book. Yeah, G. Gordon Liddy was afraid of rats, so he killed one and ate one, and that was it. He was done with yeah, it. Yeah, there you afraid go. Of rats. Uh, interestingly enough, we, we're really programmed uh, to respond to the flinch as children. If you remember the games that we used to play in schoolyards, open chest and punch bug and uh, uh, open, you know, you, you would always, a two for flinching. Remember that one? Like you would act like you're going to punch somebody, they'd flinch, and so then you would punch them. You got it, exactly. So we're actually programmed uh, with this in mind. Um, okay, you've done some astonishing things to address your flinch zones, uh, obviously. L let's talk about and get a little deeper into why people should even consider uh, being aware of the flinch and, and modulating it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I, for me, I came from, uh, I, I got to say, I probably was one of the, the biggest wusses alive for like a large part of my life. And uh, I don't know exactly how it is that exactly that moment where I started sort of recognizing what was going on. But I, I all of a sudden I was like, I started getting into sort of uh, weightlifting and I got into CrossFit and I started doing endurance uh, things and I, I walked across all of Spain, for example. How yeah, far was for, that? I remember that. I remember hearing yeah. about that. How far was that walk? It's 800 kilometers or 500 miles, so it takes like 30, 30, 35 days maybe. And uh, and so you, when you encounter, when you do physical acts, you really encounter the flinch like in a much, much more visceral way than most people do. But what I do in the book is I sort of extrapolate past the physical and say, well, your brain is really wired to keep you safe. And it does that because uh, in moments where new things happen, it realizes it doesn't quite know how to deal with it, so it just puts you into a place where it goes, okay, well, you need to step away from this first. You need to get into a place of safety, and then you make decisions from there. And although that used to be helpful, and it still is helpful if you're getting mugged, or it still is to get helpful if you're, like, in an abusive relationship, it's largely not helpful in modern society where everything is pretty much safe. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. Everything's pretty much safe. But don't you think that as society has progressed – um, for lack of better terms, the noise factor has elevated and we kind of lose some of our flinch just naturally being in today's day and age. Yeah, yeah, because we end up, we end up so, uh, overpowered by some of the stuff that happens. Like, you know, uh, your instinct, maybe if you see a stranger on the street might be to, to give him a bit of change or like put him, put a, put a sweater on him or something like that. But over and over again, you live in New York City or something like that, you might be totally, uh, you, you might, Entirely stop caring. Yeah, become numb, yeah, right. become yeah, numb you're to numbed. it. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, we, 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 I was in L.A. Uh, for the holidays. We were eating, uh, uh, eating a, a, a lunch on Rodeo Drive, and you know, I, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Now it's like this is as boring as it can get. And between the car horns beeping and the people yelling, and it's like I, I felt like I was in Vietnam eating my meal. Everybody else around me looked like they were perfectly comfortable. So obviously, your your sensitivity to things that make you flinch, uh, changes uh, by what you expose yourself to. And that's what you kind of ex espouse in the book, right? 
Right, exactly. So just like exactly like you're saying, this adjustment that you have is based on your environment, which is a totally natural thing. All living things do that. So if you are uh, if you're if you're surrounded by things that are dangerous, you will largely start to understand what that danger is. Like some people will see a bear and they've never encountered a bear, so they'll go, "Oh my god, I I don't know how to deal with that." Other people who handle bears for a living, for example, will be like, oh, well, this one's dangerous and this one is not. They have a much more nuanced understanding of what goes on. So we have a nuanced understanding of, for example, city life or of office life, but we do not have a nuanced understanding of what is actually dangerous because we never encounter danger. Right. I see what you're saying. Okay. So give me some examples of, uh, of things that you would use to exercise the flinch, if you will. So, you know, it's funny because as, I, as I've written this book and then put it out, and it's got an amazing response, which is amazing. And lots of people have been connecting with me, and they give me all these examples of things that have happened in their lives that outside of the book. And, and there are people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. And there are people who are stutterers. And then there are, like, swimmers who, like, are in the middle of an open water swim, and then they find themselves in the middle of a lake, and they go, oh, my God, you know, like, what did I just do? All these sort of moments where people uh, encounter almost like panic attack events. And the only real way to adjust to that is to uh, encounter it in a limited sort of non-dangerous way. So there are certain basic things that uh, would make your, your brain or your body flinch. One of them is to take a cold shower or to jump into, into a cold pool. And I know like even now, my actual body does not want to enter into that body of water. And so I, it provokes a reaction, even though there's no real danger to doing so. So basically, it's a slow adjustment process. You find uh, environments where there's no social or negative uh, physical consequences to what you do. So if you're really afraid of be going to a party or you don't know anyone, what you need to be doing is you need to be encountering strangers on a daily basis. And we're afraid of strangers. I mean, our, our bodies and our brains are meant to be afraid of strangers because we've only been around strangers really for the past hundred years when cities existed. Before that, we never encountered strangers. And so, of course, we aren't used to the idea. Our brains are not used to the idea of how to work with them. But when we encounter a stranger and then we screw up and then we go, oh, you know, I really sound like an idiot doing that, when you walk up to someone, the reality is that there's no, there's no negative consequences because – we don't live in tribes of 150 people anymore. Now we live in people in, in tribes of a million or five million. So we could just do these things over and over again, and our flinch reflex subsides after a while. You know, it's funny you talk about cold showers. I've been doing something for a very, very long time. Since I was in my 20s, when I lived in New York, um, and I used to go to the gym, I used to always sit in either the steam room or sauna and then jump into a cold shower. And my over the years, this uh, exercise, if you will, has becoming more and more extreme, where when I first started doing it, I would jump into a, a tepid shower, and that would feel very cold after stepping out of a sauna. But now I get out of a 160-degree sauna after sitting there for 30 to 40 minutes and walk into an ice-cold shower. I mean, I just turn the cold on and get under there, and I have to gasp for air, and uh, my, my, I start to get like, you know, when you're going to get white out, you know, my eyes start to react yeah. and my skin turns all red, but I thrive on it. I actually love it. It makes me feel invigorated and alive. So something that used to be uh, difficult for me to do that I'd have to actually force myself to do it. I actually look forward to doing it. What happens when the flinch makes that transition? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I would say it's almost exclusively a good thing. The reality is, is you can never eliminate your flinch reflex, right? Because like even if a, a butterfly enters into your field of vision, for example, from the, from the, your peripheral vision into your central vision, all of a sudden your instinct is to close your eyes and to move your head back. Because it doesn't matter if it's a bullet, if it's a punch, or if it's a butterfly, <laughs> your instinct is to protect your head. And you can never eliminate that. So... Uh, much of the psychological flinching mechanism, which is sort of trained into us, this sort of lack of courage that most people, including myself, are, are sort of bred to have, is wiped out by encountering more and more quote-unquote dangerous things which really aren't dangerous at all. And then the things that truly are dangerous, we can never eliminate that flinch reflex. So what we can do for those things is we can uh, transform it. So there's a, an amazing guy, Tony Blower is his name, and he's a specialist in martial arts who talks about the startle flinch reflex. It's a biological reflex that never goes away. And so what he does is inside of martial arts and police forces and firemen and so on, is he trains you to flinch forward instead of flinch back. Ah. So 
there's this fundamental transformation that occurs when you understand that, first of all, it's a biological instinct to protect you, and then second of all, there's parts of it that are helping you, but there's also parts that are hindering you, and to be able to make the distinction between them. Interesting. Let's do this. Let's take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I've got lots of questions. We're talk- talking with Julian Smith. Millions of people know that shrewd food is the smartest way to snack. Ever get that craving for crunchy snacks but don't want to eat all those empty carbs? Well, instead of puffed corn or wheat like most snacks, shrewd food puffs protein powder. This gives these crazy efficient macros. Two grams of carbs, 14 grams of protein. That's as high as 67% protein and with only 90 calories. So knock out the carbs but keep the amazing flavor and crunch you're looking for. Shrewd food is now available at Walmart and Sprouts. Or go to shrnetwork.biz slash shrewd food and use the code SHR25 for 25% off your order. Merrick Health is a premium telehealth platform that connects customers with partnered providers from the comfort of your home. Merrick provides concierge service with your very own patient care provider as your health advocate. You'll go over all your needs and goals from improving sexual function, hair loss prevention, increased muscle, fat loss, and overall improved performance. Prescribed treatment options can be ordered and shipped directly to you if you meet the requirements. All from the comfort of your home. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash Merrick Health. That's M-A-R-E-K-H-E-A-L and order your comprehensives and get 10% off with code SHR. Don't forget to add the lab analysis to have results reviewed with potential over-the-counter supplements or treatment recommendations. That's shrnetwork.biz slash health and use code SHR at checkout. Or order your own desired labs with code SHR and get 10% off your first lab order. Remember those rectangular toaster pastries you used to love when you were a kid? Well, Legendary Foods has just made them better. The new cake-style tasty pastry is like nothing you've ever had before. With 20 grams of high-quality protein and less than one gram of sugar, you'll feel like you're cheating, but you're not. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use the code SHR10 to save save 10% off your purchase of tasty pastries. Now available in cookies and cream, red velvet cake, birthday cake, blueberry, strawberry, brown sugar cinnamon, and hot fudge. Fudge Sunday. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash legendary and use code SHR10 today. I've said numerous times that Be Strong BFR bands are as effective, if not more effective, than anabolic steroids. And as someone who has used anabolic steroids for many years and used Be Strong BFR bands, I know what I'm talking about. You will see changes in musculature in days and weeks using Be Strong BFR bands and without any of the risks to your health associated with anabolic steroid use. Go to SHR hrnetwork.biz slash be strong that's b s t r o n g and use code shr15 to save 15 percent off i guarantee you will not be disappointed in the results of using the be strong bands check them out There are lots of concerns about food supply today. That's why you need White Oak Pastures. White Oak Pastures will deliver food right to your doorstep. You don't even have to go out and be disappointed by shopping in grocery stores. The finest beef, pork, lamb, duck, and more can be found at White Oak Pastures. And now they even have seafood. And best of all, White Oak Pastures has a negative carbon footprint, which means that you don't have to feel guilty for eating your ribeye. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash white oak and use the code superhuman to save 15% off. There have been no real breakthroughs in resistance training for over 200 years. Whether it's pulleys or free weight, they all depend on gravity and the angles associated with gravity's effect directly on the weight. All of that has changed with the ARX machine. ARX stands for Adaptive Resistance. The ARX machine uses a 25-horsepower motor. You are literally fighting against a 25-horsepower motor, so every single rep is your one rep maximum at that moment in time. But ARX leverages another technique that has been known to produce rapid muscle gains and strength and that is it leverages the eccentric or negative portion of the rep which completely blows every other exercise and resistant training product out of the water go to shrnetwork.biz slash arx and discover the future of resistance training it's superhuman radio um there's lots of discussion in this day and age about hormesis um hormesis originally was a term used um what happens to the body when it's exposed to low levels of toxins uh, over time. But really, um, we can think of the, horm- the this effect of hormesis uh, is also evident in things like vaccines. When you take an attenuated virus and you put it in the body, the body gets stronger as a result uh, to deal with those types of 
things. Isn't isn't the flinch actually more of an exercise in hormesis? God, I got to tell you, and I'm, I'm I'm not just saying this, man. I got to tell you, you're one of the most informed radio people that I have ever met, and I did radio for ten years of my life. Uh, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, hormesis is a key biological reaction to uh, to poison. It's a biological reaction to any kind of low level stress. And the idea with hormesis is is that a low level stress in one place will cause uh, several or either one or several positive reaction in, in another space of your life. So this is how, for example, basic radiation, which comes from the sun, ends up producing vitamin D in the body, which is uh, highly beneficial for health and so on, right? So right. you're totally right. Right. And that obviously happens over time that through the evolutionary process. I'm sure that there's a lot of things that we do now that we didn't do uh, when we were in the Paleolithic era uh, or even before that. So, I mean, there's, there's constant, it's constant, constantly changes going on. But now let's talk. The, the flinch that you really focus on has more to do with psychological adaptation than anything else. Um, you know, uh, I have just had two experiences where I had to reject somebody, one in a personal experience and one in a business experience and people react really and, and as I, we all do this it's like i remember my my my, my mother telling me the only reason why you want her is because she doesn't want you you know <laughs> when you break up with a girl she breaks up with you and i remember thinking about that when i was young i was like really thinking about that well, why is that and then i started to uh, be exposed to different types of uh, Eastern philosophies, and I looked at Aikido, where you use somebody else's weight against them. They, they they throw a punch, you take their arm and pull it instead of trying to repel it. So this this notion that you're talking about with the flinch here, the psychological aspect of what people can learn from your book is profound. They can use these things in day to day life. What types of exercises do you see people using for the everyday modern human being? You know, I, I said pe I, people are doing it in their own way uh, every single day. Uh, the, every, everybody has different flinch reflexes based on their, their history. Some have really unreasonable ones and some have more sort of reasonable ones that have sort of come about from everyday life or whatever. So you notice that usually uh, what it is is you've kind of led your life along this corridor and uh, what happens is, is that there's many, many sort of different avenues you could be going down. There's many, think about like a long street, you're going down Main Street of a small town. There's many different shops that you could visit along side streets, but most people just go down the main avenue over and over and over again. Those stalls and those shops end up becoming sort of like the most profitable ones for the business, but never the most profitable one for the visitor because the visitor, you know, the, the business doesn't care about them. Right. The, you, you find that you're, it's, it's sort of reduced and influenced by the tragedy of the commons. So what happens generally when you go into an avenue where most people have not gone is that you'll get uh, an amazing positive reaction because those are the spaces where you get the most psychological benefits. Those are the people where you get uh, the places where you get the most profit if you're a business that's sort of encountering the flinch, uh, which would be like a drastic change in your business environment. And so, I mean, this is the way that I see it. The way that people can do it in everyday life is they can look at the blind spots that they usually avoid, which requires some kind of outside, I was just uh, say, some kind you, of outside force. I right? was just going to say, you have to have a special awareness for this because it's very easy to identify the flinch, the actual physical flinch. But the flinch you're talking about is much more subtle, and in fact, is probably something that is a forethought that a, that causes us to veer around or not go through that neighborhood or not choose this job or not choose that outfit, and it's so subtle. How do you see that flinch? You know, it's funny that you say this because uh, for many, many years I've been thinking about this idea of, of breaking patterns as a key to what eventually became this idea of the flinch. I spent years doing a Brazilian martial art called capoeira, which is essentially the art of deception and of making patterns and that you watch your, your opponent watches you sort of make certain mm. patterns and then you break them on purpose in order to deceive your opponent into making the wrong move. It's the same thing that happens in chess or in Go and a lots of different things. And so your problem is, is that you have a number of patterns inherent in your life, both biologically and psychologically. Very simple things sometimes is always turning right instead of turning left, like Zoolander, right? And right, then more right. psychological ones, which are something like, Every time that I drive to work, I drive using a, going exactly the same way. And these are the things which sort of dig deep grooves into your brain, which eventually become unbreakable. It's how old people, you just end up talking to them about yes. 
something that just came out like, no, 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 music. But is it really because the music is bad, or is it just because you were not exposed to it when you were early on? If something came out that sounded, you know, if a movie came out that had a Marilyn Monroe like like character or actress in it, you would immediately like it. Why? Because it falls under the patterns of what it is that you already like. But we need to be able to challenge that in many, many different ways in order to be able to grow because the world is changing faster than ever. So we have to change along with it. And, you know, this is really interesting because the reality is that in order to embrace the flinch, you just have to start doing things that are outside of the realm of what you normally do. It starts out real simple. It could be as simple is dro- taking a different path to work one morning. It could mm-hmm. be as simple as doing breaking with tradition of something that you do all the time. And it's funny you should point this out, and you, you point to elderly people. There was a study done on gorillas uh, who had the same uh, environment, you know, gorillas that were kept in small cages where they really didn't have anything change. They noticed that the uh, neuronal, neuronal sprouting in their brain stopped. But... Gorillas that were then taken to more elaborate settings where they had these large, almost forests uh, to live in so that they could have different points of view, uh, you know, different venues. They could climb a tree or they could sit on the ground. And they had more of these different opportunities to do different things. The collateralization in their brain was dramatic, and it, was, and it just took a few weeks. They took, they took one of these gorillas out of the environment where they saw there was no neuronal sprouting occurring any longer, and this is about memory consolidation and, as well, and they put him in this new environment. It took three weeks before they saw the changes in the brain. So actually embracing the flinch could also improve the way your brain functions on a mechanical <clears throat> level. Yeah, I mean, your brain is, is meant to be adaptive. You know, it's, it's been doing it your whole life. It's, it's how you've adapted to become the person that you are. The set of, you don't start from a blank slate. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But you do, you are in a, in a situation where you've been making the same decisions over and over and over again. And so people are always concerned about change. You know, one of the primary reasons yes. you might be listening to this or you might be reading a book like mine is because you're thinking about how is it that I'm actually supposed to change? But the reality is, is most of the people are thinking, well, you know, oh, that's uncomfortable, so I'm not going to be doing that. Or, you know, this is a little weird. It sounds a little... The reason that you're in the situation that you're in is because of the way that you think. It's because you think the way that you do. So you, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to do things which you would not normally think are inside your, your usual realm of experience in order to change your brain, in order to change yourself. So that's really why the exercises in the flinch exist. And lots of people, I'm sure, are like, ah, oh, this is totally dumb or pointless. But the reality is, is that you don't truly know unless you've had a firsthand experience. You know only if you've actually felt it. You don't really know if you're just reading it in a book. It doesn't mean anything. What are the exercises in general? Do you have a, have a couple you can just talk about? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's tons that I, I talk about, but one of them is the idea of, uh, first of all, I make people agree before they ever read the text, which is a really fundamental part of it. You know, you enter into a relationship with maybe like a psychotherapist or something like that, he might say some things that you feel are uncomfortable, and that's the nature of what it is that you that's the nature of the social contract or whatever. So what I ask people to do is I ask them to agree to do the next thing, whatever it happens to be, and then I'll be like, next time you encounter a homeless person, give them the largest bill that you have. And if you've never done this, you'll be like, I really, this really weirds me out. And I did it myself, of course, every single thing that I've written in the book, I've done it many more. And the result of it is just a, is you realize how much of a, of a reflex you have against the things that some people would consider positive, you consider negative. Uh, Buddhist monks were always known for doing this. They wouldn't just give people things, but they would give things to the people that they hate because the people that they hate are the people that they are inclined not to like and not Uh. to give anything to. So they have to break those patterns and they have to, in order to become more generous, you actually have to act generous first. So the action actually has to come before the change in the brain. What other, before we go into this next break, is there any other simple exercises that people can try sure. other than giving I can tell people, for example, in the book, one of the things that I tell them is I'll be like, I want you to walk into your kitchen and I want you to take a cup and I promote an exercise where I tell them to break the cup on purpose. And you should try this during the commercial break. Try right now. Find a cup that you don't like. 
grab it, and I want you to go to the kitchen and break it. I want you to literally drop it on the ground. You'll discover that you have a, a psychological wall inside of you that prevents you from doing this. It's social. It's all of these things. But there's no negative consequences oh. to this, and nobody's there, so nobody's going to care. Just do it. If you do it, you'll discover your wall, and discovering that wall is a huge part of what it is that we try to work on. That is really intriguing. And that, and that wall, and then I think that with those types of exercises, by discovering these walls, as you call them, that that's where the awareness can come from about the non-visible flinch but you have to start you have to start spreading out a little bit and feeling that because it's a feeling it's not something like the flinch you can see but this is a this is an internal flinch that's very intriguing once you become aware of what it feels like then you can start to connect with the other things that you do that feel like that and identify those as well and break through that plateau as well stay tuned we'll be right back talking with julian smith about his book the flinch i would easily say that i am the hugest proponent you will ever meet to doing anything that will improve the quality of my sleep and that's because sleep is linked to just about every metabolic disorder we see in our population today one of the easiest things you can do to improve the quality of your sleep is to get a pillow that can be shaped into the exact form factor that allows you to get your best night's sleep and that is my pillow i've been sleeping with my pillow for a few years now and i can tell you that when i have to travel and stay in hotels i don't get a good night's sleep because i don't have my pillow with me right now you can save up to 60 percent off of everything offered to improve the quality of your sleep at shrnetwork.biz slash mypillow when you use the code SHR. Or you can call toll-free 800-889-4938. And remember to use code SHR to save up to 60% off of everything at their website. Dogs should be powered by fat and protein, not carbs. That's why Visionary Pet makes low-carb, ketogenic dog food for dogs of all breeds and life stages. From kibble to freeze-dried and even low-carb treats, all Visionary Pet recipes are very low-carb, ketogenic, and made with 100% real meat protein. Shop now and use code SHR for 20% off your first order today. Your dog deserves the lifelong benefits of optimal nutrition. Make the switch to Visionary and see why smart dogs eat low-carb. Never before has a product been so appropriately named as Botanic Tonics Feel Free. This plant-based elixir combines a variety of different effective compounds, all from raw plant materials that at different doses provide you with completely different experiences. A third of a bottle puts you in the zone and makes you very focused and is ideal for a non-stimulating pre-workout. It also has a mild analgesic effect for us older lifters who have soreness and little pains in and aches that keep us from training as ferociously as we want. A half a bottle will create a mild euphoric effect that will allow you to forego consuming alcohol, but still be socially lubricated and have fun. I have never had a product deliver on its name the way Botanic Tonics Feel Free does, and I won't ever be without it, and you shouldn't either. Go to shrnetwork.biz slash feel free and use the code SHR40 for 40% off your first order. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Hey, this is Carl Lenore. I am the inventor of Gun Leash. Over half a million handguns are lost in the United States every year. If you carry a gun like I do, you are 300 times more likely to lose your gun. And 15% of those guns will end up in criminals' hands and used in the commission of a crime. Gun Leash solves that problem. Gun Leash is a patented, no-tracking proximity device the size of a postage stamp. It will alert you as soon as your gun is outside of your range, so you can never leave your gun behind. To learn more and to be notified when Gun Leash is available at the end of January, go to GunLeash.com and get on our mailing list. Gun Leash. Never lose your gun. Never leave your gun. Listen strong. It's Superhuman Radio. Um, have, have you... um? been sought out by any uh, of the big corporate giants to teach the flinch inside the corporate environment? The reason I ask that is because when I was a, a young man in my first business venture living in Las Vegas, we went to um, a couple really important seminars. Back when Tony Robbins, by the way, wasn't very popular, he I sat in, uh, in one of his seminars in Las Vegas that he did on uh, neurolinguistics programming, which was really, really interesting. But anyway, one of them was about... Obtaining original thought. In order to uh, obtain original thought, you have to break through your notion of how the war world works. And one of the exercises they had was you had to play a game with four or five people. You'd pick two inanimate objects and then try to find ways to marry them together and make something real out of them. Do, do, has corporate America reached out to you at all to come in and teach the flinch? 
Yeah, I mean, the book has only been out a couple of months. Uh, the reaction has been huge. Calls for uh, uh, for me to come speak have already begun, and it's done really well. And I think actually, you know, change inside of large corporations is one of the hugest roadblocks that we have. Like we, as human beings, we naturally kind of build bureaucracies around ourselves, and then the problem becomes that these bureaucracies are no longer effective, and they're no longer like so. At one point, you know, maybe a factory was the most effective way to to compete in the marketplace, but now, you know, lots of small free agents are more agile, and really we're looking at a, at a competitive environment, increasingly competitive environment, and unless you have the ability to adapt to that, then you're not going to be able to do anything. So to me, that's what the flinch is about. It's about the ability to change not only yourself, but a company as well. And how you do that is really by changing the individuals. It's not some like who moved my cheese nonsense. Yeah, right. It's about real self-examination and diligence in the face of your own habits. Yeah, I like that a lot. Talk to me about the um, the 500 kilometer or 500 mile uh, walk. It was 500 miles, right? Not, uh, not right, exactly. 800 kilometers. Well, uh, mostly all, kind of barefoot, by the way. It's uh, barefoot it's, or with like five fingers on. With, with Vibram Five Fingers, so barely, what they're, for anybody cool. who doesn't know what they are, they're sort of uh, barefoot minimalist shoes with little toes on them. They're hideously ugly. I, I, did, I did an interview with the Vibram people a couple years ago when they were introducing the shoe, and I told them that they should have called it the Paleo Foot because it mm-hmm. really you know, right. it harkens back to being cave people with a, just a little bit of cushion. That's it, you know? So the people that have... Uh, that are in the paleo, you know, diet movement have really embraced these shoes. Yeah. And before we went to commercial, you were talking about, uh, you were talking about the idea of, uh, these gorillas and that, and, uh, if they come, f- if you put them in a tree, an environment where there's lots of trees versus a small cage, their brain begins to adapt to that environment. Right. I know people inside of the paleo movement that are doing this kind of thing, that are reteaching people how to climb trees and how to run barefoot and so on. And so as I came to know these people, I came across Vibram Five Finger Shoes. So cool. to get back to the story, what happened is, is that um, my girlfriend and myself, it was actually my girlfriend's idea. She'd been willing to, I've been wanting to do the Appalachian Trail for years, which is an American trail 2,000 miles long. Right. And uh, she wanted to go to Spain and do what's called the Camino de Santiago. So you walk basically all across Spain barefoot. You walk up and down mountains and, uh, and, and through a bunch of little towns. And it's really kind of an amazing experience. The the ability to sort of go, well, like, you know, this sounds like an insane thing. And doing the insane, you know, I don't mean criminally insane, I mean things that are considered unreasonable is one of the best ways to sort of break through your usual programming. Because right. you're in a different habit, your different habits are different people, you're doing different things than what you normally do, when normally you would stop, instead you keep going, that kind of thing. Right, right, right. So it took, how long did it take you? It took 35 days, and uh, that's did you, walking did you about camp, did you like camp? 20 miles. Did you a day. camp? Did you camp like this, or did you check into hotels, or how did you? Yeah. Do that? So some people camp, but because this is a very old, it's a religious pilgrimage route. So ah. some people do it; they're religious, and some people do it are are humanistic or whatever they they say. And uh, and the people that do it. Uh, generally, in every town, there's a place where you can stay because this thing has existed for over a thousand years. So you can go, and I mean, if you do the Appalachian Trail, that's like literally in the woods and you have to be camping every day. So you're carrying all your stuff on your back. Yeah. But here, you don't have to carry as much because you're going, you know, you know, in, in Europe, there's like towns every five miles. Yeah, it's, it's actually, Europe is built to walk through as opposed to the mm-hmm. United States, which is built to drive through. Exactly. And you notice that in uh, the way that the buildings are built. You notice that in the way that really, I mean, this is a fundamental uh, concept that brings us back to the idea of like the corridors that we build around our life is that you'll notice you know, this amazing thing happens when you walk so far. You can look at any building in a distance and I could still do it and be like, yeah, that'll be about two and a half hours walk. Uh... And you do that because of your ability because, you, you know, we, we used to walk long distances. We had to. And now we don't have to do that anymore, so we've lost the entire skill set based around all of those things. That perception of how far things are, that's really interesting. Tell me something about uh, overcoming the flinch. Okay, so I told you my story about the hot sauna cold shower thing, and it kind of just evolved to where I look forward to it and embrace it from where I used to freak out about getting in there. So I take a cup to my kitchen, I dropped it on the floor, I broke through that barrier, Am I healed? Am I flinchless now about that particular thing? Or do I have to encounter these barriers and make that decision to cross them several times? And when does that flinch go away? 
so think about this as if you were a boxer and you were entering a ring. The reality of what it is that you have to do is that you are always fighting against your natural reaction to get out of the ring and to go to some, you know, movie theater or something and watch somebody else fight in a film in which someone else gets beat up, but eventually they win. But the reality is, is this is not how people actually win. How The way people actually win is by getting in the damn ring and doing it themselves. So everybody usually, the way I would, I would talk about it in the book, is I'd say something like, like, everybody wants the glory, but no one wants the scars. Right. And, uh, and so it never does end. The reality is, because your brain is adaptable, it'll adapt upward. If you are able to do many of the things that normally make you flinch, they will, those things will, subs- will subside and you'll find yourself stronger than before. But just like, you know, at the beginning of your life, if your parents coddled you and told you, you know, never to get your, self dirty or whatever you'll have no immune system the same thing will happen if you if you find yourself sort of sort of retreating you will become whatever you put yourself through that's the the true reality of all of life from from little tiny organisms all the way up to elephants and with us in the middle that's how it works so the reality is that some wise person i don't know how long ago coined that term that i started the show with that which does not kill you makes you stronger and that really is uh, true in the end of, at the end analysis. It absolutely is. And you'll, you'll notice this. Uh, you know, it's funny. We could talk about this in a really intellectual way. And I'm sure there's a lot of philosophers that went really deeply into this and that would be more than happy to sell you a book about it. But the reality is, is that people who understand the physical aspect of challenge understand it better than ever. They understand it better than, than almost anyone. And because we're less active than we always, than we ever have been, the result is, is that few people understand, uh, fewer people understand psychological barriers than ever. So really, this is the kind of thing where you could be the first person out of all of the people that you know to be, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what happens when I try this or when I try that. But fundamentally, because we're all not just like, you know, we're not lone wolves, we're probably more like bees than like wolves where we work in packs, all of the things that you do, all of the activities that you, that, that you take part in, which will break the patterns of your own brain, also will influence the people around you. So really when you do things like this, you're actually, in a larger scale, in a larger sense, helping a community of people around you as well. You know, it's funny. I, I, one of the questions I was, I was going to ask you was on that line. Do, do you remember a book from uh, the late 70s, early 80s called The Hundred Monkey Theory? No, I've never read that. Um, it was written by some somebody out in uh, California, I want to say up in the uh, San Francisco area. He was uh, – um, well, anyway, it, the, the concept of the book was this. And it was, this is true. It's a true story. There were these monkeys, like spider monkeys or something, on an island. And they learned about yams, but they couldn't eat the yams because there was sand all over them. And there were monkeys on these other islands, too, that were inhabited with, and that had yams on them as well. And the, the, the idea was, I mean, the, the number of 100 was an arbitrary number. But at some point in time, the monkeys on one of the islands started taking the yams down to the waterline and washing them, and then they were able to eat them. And at that moment, when the this, like, consciousness occurred, all the monkeys on the other, all the other islands started doing it too. Wow. And it, 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 was, it was, this was, this was actually studied. And so it, 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 it was called the, the hundredth monkey theory, that when something reaches a certain gravity in the, in the consciousness, Everybody benefits from it. Everybody gets it. It could also be stress. Everybody suffers from it. So it, yeah, that's, yeah. Of course, that makes sense. Yeah. To yeah. us, you know, the interesting. If you look at social networks, I come from examining uh, social networks, and not just like Facebook, but like like human beings had social networks before we ever had Facebook or MySpace or whatever. Uh, what you notice is that you have a deep influence even on those you don't know, and the, they can't really. Many studies have been done, like you said, on this. They cannot explain exactly why, and I'm not trying to give it some metaphysical right, explanation. Right. What I'm trying to say instead is we simply we, we influence each other through many subtle signals, even so, some of which we, we, we don't even understand consciously. So we, you know, they call this the three degree of influence rule. So imagine your person zero and all the people that you know around you, a circle of people around you, or group one, and then the circle around them 
which they know, your friends know, but you do not. Those are group two. So if you get fat, you obviously you influence the people in group one to get fat because you know them. They might be, oh, well, you know, he gained 10 pounds. He looks fine, you know, so they don't, they, they don't feel like it's so bad if it happens to them. But then they also influence group two and group three. So they call this a three circles of influence rule. Cool. And if you have the ability to be person zero, you can have a huge impact on lots of people. You may not understand why, and you may feel like you're small, but in fact, you're very powerful if you give yourself the ability to. That's really cool. You know, so you were involved in CrossFit, and in CrossFit, you're trying to always push your your personal bests, correct? Every session, you want to get more done in a, in a specific period of time. Isn't that how it works? Yeah, exactly. So isn't that kind of a, those of us who are involved in physical culture, you know, if you, you get under the bar with 500 pounds on it and it's the first time you've ever squatted 500 pounds, even if you've done 465, 475 for a couple reps, it's still scary. It's always, you know, it's, um, uh, some of your readers may be familiar with Martin Birkin. He does the lean game. I've tried to get him on the show so many times. You know what his last response yeah. to me was? Do you know him? Yeah, I do know him. I'm a client of his. Will you tell and, him? Will you tell him that you've been on the show and it, and it was pain, it was painless? <laughs> you know what? I'll talk to him. I'll tell him. Okay. Uh, he he um, he says that uh, that the squat is the most psychologically challenging exercise, and that even if you if you, if you're even doing squats, it doesn't matter what the weight is. It could be 465, like it could be 200 pounds. And uh, if that's what your limit is, your five rep max or what have you, then you're in a place where you're doing something which is so taxing. In my case, I actually feel, I'm like, I can't believe I'm going to do this. And I'll be talking with my girlfriend. I'll be like, can I, maybe I'll just skip it this week, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, it is so difficult, but it carries forward into the rest of your life because it is so, it's so primal. It hits you in so many different parts of your brain, and your brain is screaming for you to stop, but you go forward anyway. I think it's an amazing training ritual for life. You know, the squat is absolutely much more dangerous than the deadlift. However, they're both equally um, uh, inspiring moves. If you, if you, once you learn to do them well and you're starting to use heavier and heavier weight, um, it builds a sense of self-confidence that translates to other areas of your life. And you're right. And so the, I guess the question is, for those of us who get in the gym and we, and we I mean, I used to obsess about leg day the night before. Because I'm 53, I'll be 53 this year, and I used to think to myself, man, I hope I don't blow a valve out of my heart. Or, if, you know, if I was deadlifting that day, gee, I hope I don't blow a disc. And, you know, I started obsessing the night before. You talk about flinch. I was, I started flinching the night before. Do you think mm -hmm. that that translates when you, when you break through the barriers in one area, does that help in other areas as well? Oh, I'm sure. I, I I personally feel that it does. I don't know if studies support that, but I think a lot of the athletes who are probably listening feel the same way. And here's the other thing, is that relating back to this sort of anxiety that you end up having, or because you know as you get older, maybe like you might feel like you're more fragile or what have you. Uh, really, the, you keep in mind that the that the solution is not simply to push through the flinch, although that is an important aspect to it. The real solution is technique. And the, the proper solution is form. So what we're looking for is almost like a methodology for mapping out your psychological environment. If you can say, you know, where are these sort of dark places? You know, if you ever played something like World of, not World of Warcraft, but the original Warcraft game where it was like orcs versus humans, you have a the okay. large, like 90% of the map is dark, and you have to explore it with your little characters or what have you. But this is the way our minds really do work. Most of what is going on, is in this tiny little corridor, and we never exit to find out what's going on in the sort of the dark spots. But we need to go through these these psychological, these inner psychological maps, and we only do that by facing discomfort. And fa discomfort is, in fact, what makes those maps smaller. Our purpose in life, and as children, is to make the maps as large as possible. And that's why we do things like touch burners, and you know, like punch the dog, and like put our fingers in the electrical socket, and. It's because we're trying to learn how to make our world bigger so that we can understand it. Mm. So some people, you know, they even go so far as uh, trying to balance on their hands. They become acrobats. And other people become good at writing. And then they become writers, maybe. But then at some point, as adults, we stop trying to make our world bigger. And But the people that truly understand how to make your world bigger are athletes and people that are constantly challenging themselves. So you yeah. have a fundamental part of it right there, I think. Do, do you think there's any health benefits to embracing the flinch and breaking through those barriers? You know, I mean, stress has been proven to be 
you know, to cause many, many of the, the problems that we end up having later on in life. And really, you can notice this if ever you, if you have older parents. My, my whole family is quite old, and you notice the stress that small things uh, cause them that didn't, would never have caused me any stress, and definitely not people that most people that I know are my age. So I don't know if it happens over time naturally, if like the brain ends up getting calcified or what have you, but there must be a way around this. There must be a way to fight it. And you can find exercises, just like physical exercises, that improve memory, that that uh, that help you keep your brain active. And if we can keep doing this, we're going to end up a better people, and we'll end up with a better society, a well, society that's less less afraid of of changing things and experimenting with things to see what else could work. Well, last question of the interview: Have you had people uh, who were not uh, understanding your goal lump you into the adrenaline junkie? realm you know it's funny i don't i don't get put in that one as well i get put in the tony robbins this is nonsense uh this is simplistic uh category and you know you never you, if, if you make something that's really that has a strong opinion like like the work that i do it's inevitable that you will get dissenters and that's fine and i accept that but the interesting part is is that the book the flinch is simple on purpose and it's not simple because I couldn't, you know, Mark Twain said a great thing. I tried to, I'm sorry that I, uh, that I wrote you such a, uh, a long letter. I didn't have t- time to write a short one because <laughs> writing something short. Succinct is harder, right? Exactly. <laughs> is, is, is more difficult. We've been right. talking for an hour here, but imagine that I had to condense it into five minutes. It'd be so much more difficult to do. So the idea of simplicity is in fact, you know, Steve Jobs would agree, one of the core uh, goals in the work that we do. So, so to me, that's a big part of it. And, and maybe going back to lifting and going and doing back to, going back to other things like that, like physical things, we need to find those key exercises that will keep us in a strong, agile state for the rest of our lives. I'm still looking for everything. I haven't solved all these problems, but I'm looking and I think that other people should be looking too. You know, it's interesting too, because we talk about how stress is, uh, is, is really life threatening and we know that it is. And so the, and I was thinking about this the other day in the shower. I mean, this is quite innocuous. I was thinking about the idea of being conservative in life in general. If the shower is too hot, do you turn the cold higher or do you turn the hot lower? And I'm, I'm, this is just rhetorical. This is what I was thinking of the other day. I was thinking, you know, conservative people probably turn the hot down and non-conservative people probably turn the cold up. And so I was thinking about, you know, and, and, and listening to what you're saying and, and I'm saying, you know, Everybody in the mainstream uh, stress management world is telling people to relax and calm down, and be cal- and you have to manage your stress, be more calm, be more relaxed. But is that really the answer to a society like the the lunch I had on Rodeo Drive the other day? I felt like I was in Vietnam. A calm person would have jumped out of their skin; they couldn't finish, you know, their meal. I just I had a second glass of champagne. But anyway, you know, it's like maybe the answer to stress management isn't trying to calm down, but pushing the threshold of what really bugs you farther up. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I, it's just as long as we continue to explore what the solution is, because our world's going to continuously change. So it's just we can't ever accept that we have a single answer. You know, yeah. if we think that we have one single answer, we're just going to rely on that no matter how inefficient it becomes over time. So really it's about this process of constant exploration and adaptation. Yeah, I, and I agree. think that we're learning that athletes especially know that. So yeah. I feel like I'm talking to my people. I really, you know, it's a great thing to be doing. They are your people. You could be on the level. That, no doubt about it. My mantra is stronger is younger. If you can continually get stronger as you age, then are you not acting like someone who is younger? We always attribute youth to having the strength. If I, if I, if I can keep getting stronger as I age, and I'm pushing back time as far as I'm concerned. I totally agree. You know, this is amazing. If you ever have a chance to look it up, an amazing program called Operation Pull Your Own Weight. And it's about getting children to be able to do pull-ups because pull-ups being the main exercise. If you could do one pull-up, you're about the right weight and you're about the right strength. Interesting. And most people, most children, never, most people and children can't even do one pull-up. Yeah. So even starting with that and that being a primary goal for children will keep them strong and agile and stuff like that. It's a great goal. I like that. Hey, listen, Julian, I know you're a busy guy. Thanks so much for being on the show today. My pleasure. It was great.